Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. See, I got it right this time, dear listener. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. The podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves to you. So Mr. Bob Greenberg, can you tell our listeners and viewers a little about who you are? Uh, I'm a 63-year-old male who likes walks on the beach and lying by the fireplace with my loved one. Um, Seriously, I have been a uh, writer and editor for the last uh, 42 years at Starlog Press, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, Crazy Press, Hither and Jan, um, currently freelance writing and uh, high school English teacher in Maryland. Oh, so you read some interesting creations from the kids. Indeed. Usually excuses. Uh, dog ate the homework. I totally understand. All right. And so next we have Mr. Michael Jan Friedman, otherwise known as just Mike. Uh, can you tell us about who you are? Yeah. Um, I'm a writer of uh, 80 books. Um, 11 of which, a lot. Yeah, 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 11 of which have been on the New York Times uh, bestseller list. Um, I've written about 200 comics. Uh, I co-wrote an episode of Star Trek Voyager, uh, audio books, um, you name it. Um, I've also worked a little bit in cable and network television and, uh, and, in, and in movies one time with, with Bob. So, um, uh, you can find my books pretty much pretty much anywhere, but specifically the best place is crazyapress.com, which I guess we'll get to later. Absolutely. And I'll have all that linked in the show notes, dear listener. Uh, so the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. And so we were actually introduced to these fine folks through Mike Lafferty, who's been sending us some uh, some good people from the Kickstarter circuit. So we're trying to diversify instead of just all the sci-fi and fantasy authors Doc and I know. We're trying to branch out a little bit to bring you new content. And so that's how we first found them. So how did you guys meet Mike? Mike Lafferty specifically. Mike reached out to me, what, last summer about writing for Blaster Bolts? Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, okay. uh, And, you know, we wrote the story. I wrote my story. Mike wrote his story. We got paid. We were very happy with with the process. And, uh, you know, looking forward to Mike uh, kickstarting the collection so that more people can find this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. Writing, writing for the for that for that anthology uh, was great because uh, it it kind of it put me in a position where I had to write a space western, which is something I really hadn't done before, and mm-hmm. I really liked the challenge. Challenge is always good. All right. So we wouldn't be the Blasters and Blades podcast if we didn't do the religion question. So we're going to put you on the spot. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? We're going to let you go first, Mike. Uh, Star Trek. Star Trek. I, it's not that. I don't, want to, I don't want to give you the impression I don't love those others. But, but to me, that's the most cerebral um, of the three. It's the one that makes you think the most. And... Uh, and so that's uh, that's why I like it the best. Okay. Me, um, and what about you, Bob? For me, it's Star Trek simply because it made the deepest impression on me that led me into the world of science fiction. You know, Mike and I are over a generation where there wasn't a lot of science fiction to pick from. You know, it was like Star Trek or Lost in Space, and at that point it was a no-brainer. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. Like, I liked Lost in Space. I watched the Nick at Night. They did the reruns uh, when I was a kid of all the black and white Lost in Space. But it was definitely very campy. And I'm told it was campy even for its time. It yes. was. That's true. So, That's true. Whereas, That's true. Where even, even now, looking at some of the original Star Trek episodes, like, it's campy because the graphics have changed so much and some of the social mores have changed in the attire. But as far as the episodes, I think they played it pretty straight for serious. Um, oh, they and some did. of those still hold up. So yeah. yeah. So as a longtime sci-fi nerd who loved Star Trek, how did it feel when you got to work in that environment and write for them? It was amazing. It was amazing. You know, I uh, uh, my when my agent at the time said to me, you know, she said, "Would you would you think about writing for like a Star Trek book?" I was like, 
are you kidding me? I can't think of anything that would be more fun. Um, I had I had read a, a number of Star Trek books, particularly by uh, a guy who's now my friend, Howie Weinstein and Ann Crispin, and uh, and the idea of writing one of those was <clears throat> very appealing. My, so was there it, anything that you... Oh, you wrote for them too? So I'll get right back to you, Bob. Was there anything yeah. you added, Mike, to the universe that's just you that when you look at, if it continues, you know that was your touch? Or did you just play with the, the lore as it was? For the most part, we had to play with the lore, but I did add the crew of the Stargazer. Um, Picard's, okay. Picard's uh, original, uh, original command. Um, there was only one crewman mentioned in The Next Generation, this guy Vigo. Just you know, just a throwaway, and uh, I I wrote a book called Reunion, which was the first Next Generation hardcover, and um, and in that it was a murder mystery, and in that I fleshed out the crew of the Stargazer, which was probably more fun than anybody should be allowed to have, <laughs> and get paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So so what about you, Bob? So I understand you wrote for them as well. So what was that like well, as a longtime fan well, writing in? Let me start by saying, when I joined DC Comics as an editor in 1984, DC had the Star Trek license and Marv Wolfman was editing it. But Marv was getting busier and busier with uh, the Crisis on Infinite Earths and New Teen Titans. So he left his um, part-time job as an editor on staff and handed me the Star Trek comic to edit. So this was my dream come true, uh, which was an amazing experience. And through that, I got to know the people at Pocket Books uh, because we were trying to coordinate and make sure we weren't both going to do Klingon stories the same summer and that sort of thing. And I was invited to um, some of the cocktail parties they held in New York for the area writers where I met the, the guy on my right over here. And he started writing that the Next perfect. Generation comic book for me. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, Bob, Bob also... That, wrote some novels, some Star Trek novels of his own. He did. Nice. So um, for you, dear listener, if you're listening, when we put this up and it will be on the on the Facebook group for the comment section, you should tell us what your favorite property is and what one you'd love to write in. And it'll be we can have a discussion going on. All right. So let's let's move on so uh, so we don't get distracted. Uh, well what about for the fantasy side? Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings or Wheel of Time? Uh, Lord of the Rings, because because I read okay. that I read that you know at a, at a I, I was in I was in middle school when I read that when I started reading it I think I was married by the time I finished but but <laughs> I was in middle school and 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 it had such an effect on me it was so so poignant and so it, you know so it, it it got me in a place I didn't even know I had and uh, and <laughs> so it'll always be. Uh, the the my, my my first best fantasy. I, I would have to say the same be, because I read it in high school and it had a deep impact on me. And as a teacher, I'm, um, our school is having the students read The Hobbit and each installment of the uh, trilogy as part of their summer assignments over the four years they're in high school. And I explained to them that it is so foundational and so inspirational for most of 20th century fantasy and science fiction writing based on its world building and its character uh, that they need to understand this important work that all else has been based on. And I have to say, again, I've never read Robert Jordan, so no this to him, but Game of Thrones certainly would not be here without uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, I can see that. The, uh, the other cool thing about the Lord of the Rings, at least, is that the circle he ran in was so impressive. And yes. then you look at the life story of the writers that came out of that era that survived the Great War. And it and you can once you know that and you go back and you reread it, because I did that as a English lit class in college. Once you study like the brief history of what they were writing as a backdrop and then you reread it and some of the stuff you didn't even notice, but contemporaries of him would have start mm -hmm. to start to kick out as, as super impressive mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah 
Uh, at one point in time, I was a uh, English poli sci history triple major. Although Ooh, my wow. advisor said that wasn't impressive, that was just a failure to commit. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, we here at the Blasters and Blades love both the fantastical and the scientific. So, which was your first love, sci fi or fantasy? And we'll start with you this time, Bob. Um, I have to say, it's got to be the science fiction because I started with comic books with Superman. So, he was my first alien. And that led me from comics, led me to science fiction. Uh, my dad said to me one day, you know, if you like this uh, science fiction stuff on TV and in the comics so much, try this. And he handed me a copy of Asimov's Mysteries, which was a collection of his uh, science fiction mystery stories. And that just led me right. That was the gateway into science fiction prose. So fantasy follows. Okay. Ooh. What about you, Mike? I think um, it, it, like Bob, it was comics to begin with. And the the science fiction oriented comics, so it was, uh, Green Lantern, Flash, um, um, uh, Martian Manhunter, Superman, that kind of thing. Um, I think uh, sorry, so I leaned towards science fiction initially, but uh, fantasy came in pretty soon after that, um, and uh, I like them. I like them both. I like them both. So what was your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction content in general? Was it those comics? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember um, the first comic I ever got was a, was a, a DC um, science fiction anthology comic. And uh, shortly after that, I got um, uh, a Green Lantern comic and then Secret Origins number one, believe it or not. Got that off the newsstand. And um, uh, yeah, it was it was um, it was it was comics, and and I remember I specifically remember sitting in the backyard with my parents, reading reading comics, because they were you know they they weren't into it uh, uh, from the time they were a little, but when they were little, they were into it, and uh, and they actually supported the idea of my reading comics, like unlike a lot of a lot of parents uh because to them it was reading and if you were reading you were in good shape okay what about you bob it's pretty much the same thing uh it was it was the comics and then asimov's uh, prose and from there somehow i made the leap from asimov to ellison really fast and ellison was all about speculative fiction so that, you know that was really eye-opening mind-blowing even you know as a young teen so did you guys ever read any of the Highline Juveniles or, or did those miss yeah. you? I don't know uh, exactly when all of those came out. I did. I did. I, I, um, it was one of the, one of the first uh, pieces of science fiction prose that I read was, was one of them. I can't remember which one. But, but as Bob says, you know, once, once you get the bug, uh, it doesn't matter that you're only six years old. Pretty soon you're reading pretty adult stuff. Because because you you just love what you know you just love the the idea of science fiction. And I somehow missed the Heinlein juveniles. I don't know. Maybe I should go back and read them as as my mind atrophies. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I grew up in a military town, so people were always moving, which means yard sales were always a thing. So uh, you could get some some books that were probably older than my contemporaries would be reading. Right. Just by going to yard sales, and you'd get like a bundle of them for like a quarter or whatever it was going for. So yeah, I, I had a lot of the Heinlein juveniles that you know various dads were just getting rid of because um, I think they came out in the fifties and then early sixties is when those were coming out. Also, so, also I think our, I read a lot of I read a lot of other things, uh, adventure and mystery and so on. I was very big on Hardy Boys. I had a friend. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> a mile away across a park through garden apartments and i would every other day i would sneak out of my parents backyard cross the park go through these alleyways to get to my to my friend's house to swap out the book i borrowed for another one and his parents must have said what is with this kid you know he shows up at dusk you know, all on his own seven years old yeah. So did you read them straight through or did you cheat to see so you knew who it was going to be for the whole time? No, I read them straight. I read them straight through. 
Yeah, I, I could never do that with a mystery. I always cheated and read the back first. Oh wow, Jr. It's about the journey. <laughs> That's what Doc always tells me. She yeah. she says I'm a horrific her heretic for that. But yeah. so, what is it about speculative fiction that you guys both love? And we'll go with you this time, Bob. You get to go first. I think it's the what might be. I think it's the the extrapolation of where we are and where we're going, and you know how a single decision can send you in a, a unforeseen directions. It, 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 I think it's just I'm captivated by the possibilities. Okay, and Mike, what about you? Yeah, it's it's the literature of ideas. It's 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 taking something you know and and asking questions about it. And I found that, you know, I found that fascinating. It was so much more interesting than a story that had human interactions without that. Uh, I, I, it, was, it was really, for me, it was initially at least, it was more about the ideas than the characters. Okay. Is it still more about the ideas than the characters for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's the characters? Now it's, now it's very much about the characters, but, but it's about how they interact with the ideas. I mean, I, I, I have a, uh, I, these days I, I deconstruct a lot of, a lot of uh, science fiction and superhero motifs. So it, it's still about the ideas, but it's, but it's about how the characters respond to the, to the science fictional situation. Okay. So how did your love of science fiction or speculative fiction, excuse me, transition into you writing stories in this space, Mike? Um, well, I always wanted to, and, and I actually did, you know, but I never thought, I never thought I'd be doing it professionally. And uh, one day, uh, Isaac Asimov came to my college and he spoke and he said he was a full time science fiction writer at that point. I was like, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Um, I, I read Asimov, of course, as, a, as well as a lot of other writers, but I didn't know he was a full-timer. I said, wow, that's incredible. And, but I didn't think I would ever do that. I, I always, in college, you know, I would, I would always say if I could write one book, just one book, I'd be happy. That would be enough for me. Um, and then I, I was in college and I was writing a humor column for the school newspaper, uh, a weekly column. And uh, there was a guy there, another student who liked my work. And he said, Mike, when you, when you um, write your, your novel, uh, he had a lot of faith in me, uh, you bring it to me. So a few years later after college, I wrote a novel and I brought it to him. And he was like astounded, like you, you actually did this? And uh, he, he read it. He said, Mike, this could be the next great science fiction classic, or it could be a pile of horse manure. I have no idea. I don't read this stuff. So uh, he sent me to an agent, another agent. And, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, the other agent said, well, you know, we're, we're not looking for any new writers right now. So in my bravado, I said, uh, don't you want the next Stephen King? And they said, well, we're actually very happy with the current Stephen King. Thank you. And... <laughs> And so I'm with Stephen King's agent, and 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 I did something good. One of the few good things, smart things I've done in life. I said, um, uh, "Who else can you recommend me to?" And they sent me to another agency, who um, who uh, read uh, my manuscript and uh, tweaked it a little bit and took it to a publisher. And the next thing you know, I had a, I had a gig. I you know. They uh, had a contract and they were putting out my book. Nice. Was that sort of surreal when you went to the first bookstore and found yours on the shelf? It was surreal. It was surreal right from the time I got the right from the time I got the um, the word over the phone that that Warner was going to buy my books. Um, I I walked out of I was working for a magazine at the time and I walked out of work and I was it was in Manhattan on the east side and I looked around and it was like, I felt like I owned the place, you know, I'm getting it published. It, it was an amazing feeling. All right. So, so what about you, Bob? What was it um, like when, like, how did you transition from just loving the genre to writing content for it? You know, 
I had a different path than Mike in that I wanted to be a writer, but I loved journalism. I was going to work for the newspapers or magazines. Uh, and as I was graduating college in 1980, the only magazine that had a job for me, because it, it was a tough economic period, was Starlog Press. So I was writing about science fiction movies and television series and books. And that was really exciting. And that you know led to my joining DC Comics, where there I was, editing stories and all. Uh, and it wasn't until I started to meet the Star Trek authors at these cocktail parties I mentioned that the idea of writing fiction even seemed like a possibility and ended up uh, being welcomed into a, a collaborative novel with Mike and uh, Carmen Carter and Peter David. And that was my gateway. And yes, it was surreal to see a book with my name on it in a bookstore. It was deeply depressing to find the same book in a used bookstore years later because like somebody didn't want it anymore. Bob, I only brought it to that bookstore because I had more than enough. That's the only reason. <laughs> okay. So many authors will let the, their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that you think shaped you as a storyteller? Uh, Bob? Huh. That's a, that's a good one. Um, our, our mutual friend, Howard Weinstein, always accuses me of never mining my life where I've had all these things. I, in my mind, I've, I haven't had enough life experience compared to some people. Uh, so, you know, I just poo poo everything and say, I've got nothing to mine. And he goes, but you've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And I somehow never go there. So no, I really, I probably should, while I've got time left. I, I mine Bob's life a lot. I use a lot of things from his life in my book. Um, but I, I think um, usually I, it's the sex scenes. It is the sex scenes. <laughs> it's why they're so compelling. Um, I think uh, uh, first of all, I think I, I think there's a too much emphasis on writing what you know. Okay, I mean, you know, if I wrote what I knew, you know, there wouldn't be, I, it'd be a pamphlet basically. Um, and uh, and I've never been to space. This will shock you. Never been to space, but I've written 35 Star Trek books. So, um, you know, you have to sometimes write beyond what you know. But I, but I have there are there are elements of my life that have showed up in the books. Um, I was I was a fencer in college, so when I whenever I wrote about Picard, I, I always thought about the possibility of maybe putting in a, a fencing scene. Um, I wrote an anthology recently, a collection of, of my own short fiction, and uh, one of the stories was called Floaters, because I had just gotten these floaters in my eye, and I was like, geez, these are crazy. What could... And it started, it, it got me to thinking, you know, what, what could these floaters be if they weren't just like little clotted pieces of emulsion in the back of the, uh, the eye? You know, what else could they be? So yeah, I, I, I use stuff uh, from real life when it's, you know, when I think it's promising. Okay. That's a, that's a good answer as any. I don't think um, anybody is ever satisfied enough with their life that they feel like they've just got, unless they're like extremely narcissistic, that they, they feel like, oh, I've got enough life experience now. Because you always think, well, there's there's always something more. I remember I started writing as a writing as therapy class that the VA was putting on after I came home from my second tour in Iraq. And I actually told the writing instructor who was a college professor at William and Mary. And I told her that and I'm like, I don't think I, I have enough life experience yet after she read the first story that I wrote, because it's basically using fiction as a, as a proxy for your own like trauma. And so you didn't have to be as close to it. She's like, you've been to two war zones. What more life do you want? And I, I, it got me thinking. And I'm like, I wonder how many other people are waiting to, quote, have the ticket that says they've had enough life to write stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I would tend to agree with her, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know. So you, you wrote a lot of uh, Captain Picard. So did you have to drink Earl Grey hot to get in the mood, like to get the, mo the mindset right? <laughs> I, I actually had to bathe in it. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how much detail you really want here, but but uh, um, I 
you know, it, it's funny. Sometimes, sometimes my wife would come into my office while I'm writing a Picard story, and she'd hear me like speaking like Picard. You know, engage, and and she'd go, "What is going on? Why are you talking <laughs> yourself?" And uh, 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 so I do things to get myself in the mood. Earl Grey, not so much. <laughs> I'm more of a coffee guy, so I don't blame you. All right, so we're going to transition from the writing side and talk about things from the fan angle. So has anybody cosplayed your characters or done fan art yet? I wish I could say yes, but not that I know of. I mean, you know, unless you want to count, you know, the the actors from the Suicide Squad movie because that was the comic I helped edit and create, and now all of a sudden I see these people on on screen in, in those costumes. Right, right. I mean, I'll take that. That's that's the <laughs> ultimate professional uh, yeah. cosplay. So, uh, and I, I guess Mike, you can claim everyone that's ever done um, Star Trek: The Next Generation fan uh, fan art or um, cosplay. They're, they're totally doing your episode of it. They're doing it because of me, of course. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, I, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think. I think I, I think I have seen some fan art. I did a I did a uh, uh, superhero comic for DC called Dark Star. And, and I think occasionally I have seen uh, fan art of, of the characters in Dark Stars. And if you, dear listener, are doing any uh, any fan art or cosplaying of their, their content, we're going to put their uh, newsletter link in the bottom. Sign up and then send them all the things you've done. They would love to see it. Absolutely. Uh, the artist's fancy. So... Um, all right, so Mike, has anyone asked for your autograph since you started writing? I'm trying to think. Um, it's, I, I think I've probably signed, I don't know, it's going to sound conceited, but I don't know, thousands, thousands of autographs. We'll say that. I mean, what you have to understand, JR, is that uh, Mike and I, twice a year, are down at a Baltimore Bay. Baltimore based uh, conventions and every Friday night is where the authors sit at tables and meet with the fans. So people are bringing up, you know, boxes of our books and our comic books and get us to sign that. And that's, you know, just two shows a year. Then each of us do other shows or we do bookstore signing. So it adds up over the course of a career. Also when, when we do um, an anthology, uh, which, which we'll, we'll talk about soon, you know, I one of the one of the uh, stretch goals often is uh, a certain number of author signatures. So Bob and I wind up signing a lot of anthologies that are sent out to backers as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you guys remember the first time you were asked for your autograph? Oh, first time um, as a professional writer, you're saying. Um, I don't. I don't. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm blanking. It might have been at one of these shows, um, or maybe probably at a probably at a Barnes and Noble or something where I did a, a signing. Probably, but yeah, okay. I don't specifically remember the first one. I'm going to guess it had to be a convention in 1985 when I was on staff at DC and I had some comics with a name in the credits. Okay. We'll take that. So have you ever spotted anybody out in public reading your content, the stuff that you created? Bob? Yeah. yeah I, I've seen people reading comics I've worked on. Um, haven't seen anyone with my, with my books, which explains my sales. Uh, but certainly the comics I've seen uh, um, on beaches, on public transport, yeah, and which is always cool. I've I've seen people reading my books in bookstores, and 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 nice. at, first, at first I used to go over and say, "Hey, you know, it's my book," and you know because I thought, "Oh, they'll be so happy to hear, oh, this is the author." You know, it, it, the more common reaction is they look at you and they go, "Oh, that's nice," and they put it back and they walk away. So I don't do that. <laughs> Just watch to see what kind of facial expressions they have. Fair, fair. All right. That's, um, 
I, I think newer authors don't always get that that ability to have because so many people read digitally these days. Yeah. That the only really way you'd know is if you're like peering over people's shoulders and that gets a little creepy. Yes, <laughs> right, yes. right. So, so finally, what is the weirdest or funniest interactions with fans you've had since you started writing? We'll start with you this time, Mike. The funniest interaction I've had with a fan. Well, I mean, w when I first started writing, I was writing um, uh, uh, Swords and Sorcerers. Uh, um, I, I wrote a trilogy and then a single book. Um, and um, uh, the book was about the Norse gods surviving to the present day. And then, you know, there's something that draws them back into the, you know, the survivors of Ragnarok, draws them back into the, into the nine worlds of Norse fantasy. And... Um, uh, I got a I got a letter from a reader who said, you know, it's so it's what you do is so realistic, and, and you know I, I appreciate that, um, and and I, and I and I know the value of that realism because you know you're writing about Norse gods. I have a feeling you might be a Norse god, and but but that's not so unusual because I'm a I'm an Egyptian god and my girlfriend's a Greek god. And, you know, it's like, wow, I have to find out where this guy lives and make sure he doesn't, I have to change my address. <laughs> Can you top that, Bob? That's kind of hard to do. He's been talking no. to the gods. <laughs> no, I can't. You know, I'm racking my brain. I've had, I've been a, attending conventions in a professional capacity since 1980, 81. And I've had many, you know, obviously countless interactions with fans. But nothing that stands out is particularly funny or particularly bizarre. But there so is that, there is that mm -hmm. story. There is that story about about my mother's cousin. Why don't you tell that? So so I one of the first Star Trek books I, I wrote was in collaboration with Bob and a couple of other writers. And um, um, my mother asked me, she goes, Do you know a guy named Bob Greenberg? And I said, yeah, he's a friend of mine. We collaborated on a book. She goes, because my cousin is friends with his mother. And, and she was telling my cousin about her son and how he's writing Star Trek books now. She goes, and I thought you were writing Star Trek books. So, so I said, well, they must know each other then. And <laughs> sure enough, we, you know, we more than knew each other a little. That's awesome. Okay. All right. So this is um, where we talk about everything you have written. So we're going to start with you, Bob Greenberger. Uh, can you give us the Reader's Digest version of everything you've written? So, you know, fans want to check you out. Uh, from, from a nonfiction standpoint, I've written numerous essays for anthologies uh, on a wide variety of historic topics. And I've written media tie-in fiction beyond Star Trek. I've done some original science fiction and a handful of fantasy stories, uh, mostly through Crazy A Press. Um, I've done uh, nonfiction about comic book characters like encyclopedias and, and all. Uh, so it's very broad, not particularly deep, but a lot of fun. Okay. So I know with, with authors who've been at this for a little bit, some of the stuff they wrote in their early career sometimes goes out of print. Uh, although that's sort of changing with the with the ebook revolution. So, if is there any place where someone could go to get your your back catalog bibliography and say, "Hey, that looks interesting. Let me read it," or is it just catch as catch can? For me, it's a uh, actually have everything I've written in and out of print uh, at my website bobgreenberger.com, and uh, there's a tab for all my works and it can be sorted by short stories and novels and things I've edited or, or essays I've written. So that that's uh, probably the good starting point. Okay. So is there any plan to bring some of that older stuff back to print now that eBooks are, you know, make that a little bit easier or I don't know how contracts were back then. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, early stuff were, um, media tie-in fiction owned by the copyright holder so uh it's not for me to say some of my original okay. earlier works um i do i do have uh one is in print one i need to get back into print um and you know there wasn't a lot of original stuff in the back in the early days 
more so now and more so under my copyright so I can control it. So is there any plan for the media tie-in at some point to file the serial numbers off and republish it as a Bob original? No, no, I'd rather move on with newer stuff rather than take time to, to you know, revise all their work. Fair, fair. All right. And what about you, Mike? How can, what, what are you uh, known for? What's your body of work? Let's get the I Reader's say, Digest version here. I would say more Star Trek than anything else. I wrote 35 or so Star Trek books. So that's the that's that's my my biggest footprint. But I've also written uh, Aliens and Predator and Marvel superheroes and DC superheroes and uh, Lois and Clark and Wolfman and and so on. So I've written quite a bit of other tie-in fiction. And lately, I write uh, original original fiction uh, under the auspices of our our publishing consortium, the Eighth Press. Um, I think I've written about 10, 10 books for mm -hmm. Crazy 8 and edited a few more. Um, and uh, so if somebody wanted to find my earlier stuff, they would either go to, um, uh, you know, look for a Star Trek book with my name on it, um, or they would go to crazy8press.com and look at my newer work and also some of the things that I've brought back into print where I own the rights. Okay, well, this would be a good place to, to do that. And let's. So, what can you tell us about this Crazy Eight Press? You mentioned it in the in the build up to the show and a little bit in the pre show. So, so what is that for people that might not have heard of you? Or Mike had to go to one day. Mike had to go to the bathroom, and boy, was that a mistake. Well, the mistake <laughs> was coming out of the bathroom. Um, you know, for a while, this is back about 12, 13 years ago. Uh, uh, I, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw that traditional retailers and traditional publishers were were having problems and and I was worried about uh, preserving the relationship between the reader and the writer because that's that's the important one right that's the essential one so uh, uh, so I said we should start our own group because not only because of these uh, challenges in the publishing world but also because things had changed publishers no longer had, uh, the exclusive access to the means of production. They no longer had exclusive access to the means of distribution. And, uh, and they were never good at marketing. So that really wasn't a, a, an, an asset for them. So I said, we can do this. We can go direct to the reader. And, you know, for a long time, everybody went, yeah, yeah, Mike, that's great. That's, that's good. Hold that thought. I, I got to go. But uh, finally, after, after it looked like Borders was going to go out of business, we, uh, uh, I, uh, they took me a little more seriously. So one day, I'm at a convention. I come out of the bathroom. And there's a gauntlet of my of my fellow writers, and they say, "Okay, Mike, we're ready to listen." And uh, and <laughs> they were not only good writers and accomplished writers, but they also had other talents. They were they were good at at editing, or they were good at marketing, or something along those lines, and or technology. And so, um, so we put our heads together. We came up with Crazy Eight Press, and uh, originally, I think there were six of us, and uh, which sounds weird because it's Crazy Eight, but you know, it's crazy. And uh, now there are ten of us. And uh, when we put out an anthology, a group project, we often invite other writers to to help us, which is what we're doing with our current project, um, Phenomenons. Uh, a season of darkness. Okay, uh, and we'll link the Crazy Eight Press in the show notes as well. So, is that um, only doing the the anthologies that, that that I saw, you know, on the Kickstarter, or what? All kinds of books does Crazy Eight do? Basically, each writer is free to write the type of book that they want. So, Peter David felt like writing a. Um, you know, vampire, tongue-in-cheek novel, have at it. Uh, whereas, um, you know, other people are exploring uh, detective fiction or detective crossing over to science fiction or, you know, a um, modern-day Aztec private eye. Uh, we've got 
all sorts of speculative fiction, um, science fiction. We've got fantasy. Uh, one of our contributors, Paul Kupperberg, um, had is a uh, young adult novel that he just published a couple, last year. Uh, so, you know, it's a variety of things. These are, what we do is, is we, we write the, the, the thing that's nearest and dearest to us, the, the type of thing that a traditional publisher might not be able to, to publish for one reason or another. We can do that. We, uh, we, um, we have the readership and we have the, uh, the leeway to, to do whatever we want. So, for instance, Bob mentioned uh, my, my 21st century Aztec Empire noir murder mysteries. Uh, and uh, that's something I wanted to do for a long time. Traditional publishers said, you know, it's, it's a little odd because it does. Where does it go in the bookstore? You know, a bookstore buyer would have a lot of trouble with that. But we don't have that problem. Uh, so we can we can do the we can what we do reflect our most um, uh, authentic and closely held um, uh, ambitions when it comes to uh, to writing. And the anthologies. Go ahead, Jr. Um, I was just say, is this something that you know you take submissions if somebody because some of our most of our audiences are just readers, but some of them are, are, you know, they would like to write. Is that something you guys take submissions or? You have to understand, we, we have no money. <laughs> if you publish through Crazy 8, you're taking on the expense of having the book designed and cover artist and having it printed and all. What we provide is marketing support. You can hire, you, we've got people who can do the design and, uh, you know, turn turn your manuscript into an ebook. Uh, we've got people with marketing experience, and you've got the ten of us who can shop from our social media mountaintops, uh, help get the word out, and help get your book into print. And um, after eleven years, our imprint, in theory, has some meaning to people. Uh, so, on very selective basis, we have published other people's works. Uh, but these are people that we know, and at least one of us um, vouch for these people. Um, so this guy named Christopher Abbott, whose first novel uh, we published there. Uh, we've done some um, essay anthologies on the Batman TV series that Jim Beard edited um, that needed a home. Um, and since we can, several of us contributed essays to those books, anyway, it made sense for it to come out through us. Uh, so it's very, very selective. Right, right. We're not, we're not, um, in, we're not trying to draw business that way. We don't. We're not looking for other writers. But if somebody comes along and we and we feel we can help them, we'll do so. Okay. All right. So you were about to uh, expand about the anthologies, Bob. Oh uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned seeing the anthologies on Kickstarter. Uh, because we invited other people to join these anthologies these days, uh, we like to pay them and we'd like to make sure we can guarantee to pay them for their time and their effort. Uh, so we go to the Kickstarter route uh, to help raise the funds to cover paying for the talent, the cover and uh, printing and shipping. Right. Uh, currently we're, we're uh, we have a Kickstarter campaign um, uh, with about, I think we have about eight days left um to support the publication of phenomenon's season of darkness this is the second uh book in a, in a series of uh of shared world anthologies prose anthologies and um what we did is we we came up with our own superheroes and uh created a world for them uh, a world where the uh 2008 financial crisis never got resolved and People are hurting as a result. Um, the um, there uh, a, a hero emerges to fight what are essentially uh, 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 a class of American oligarchs, right? Because because just because things are bad doesn't mean the rich can't get richer. And uh, to cement their their place in uh, in in on their uh, financial stratum. They uh, they uh, they do some evil things, and uh, and they keep the common man down. And so these heroes have arisen to to fight that sort of thing. Um, and and it's a it's, a, it's an interesting array of of heroes because 
as editor, I didn't I didn't dictate to anybody what they what they should do. And so everybody came up with, with their own uh, superhero that interested them in particular. So we have on, on one hand, so we have some some uh, heroes that may seem familiar, like we have a super speedster uh, that Paul Kupperberg writes called Torque. And you go, oh, I've seen superheroes, you know, super speedster heroes before, but not like this one. This one is a guy who's, who's, who's got problems that I don't think I've seen a superhero have before. So he's, he's, he may seem uh, uh, familiar, but he's not. And then we have uh, um, characters who don't even seem familiar, uh, like um, uh, Marie Viber, uh, one of our writers, uh, writes a character called Lipstick Lily. And Lipstick Lily fights crime with an array of specialty lipsticks. So I have a feeling you haven't seen that before. So we have this world and we have all kinds of characters and, and each one is a, is a, a peculiar expression of, of the individual writer. So it's, it's got a lot of power, it's got a lot of intrigue and, and it's very, very entertaining. And, uh, and as I say, we're, we're partway through the Kickstarter. We, uh, as always, we can use some help. And, um, uh, and this is only the second volume in what promises to be more. Okay. Well, before we dive too deeply in that Kickstarter, why don't we take a moment where we shamelessly shell for the man. In a world where magic is controlled by law and government, mages are both coddled and persecuted. Corey Monroe knows she isn't a mage, and her best friend is. Reality isn't always what you know. If you are looking for an urban fantasy with found family, an education-based magic system, and evolving storylines, try My Luck by Mel Todd, book one in the Twisted Luck series, available exclusively on Amazon. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. And thank you for our lovely sponsor, Miss Mel Todd. So um, we were getting ready to dive into the Phenomenon Season of Darkness anthology. So where did the premise for the universe, first let's do, where did you get the premise for this universe that is the, the um, Phenomenons? Well, you know, uh, uh, the first the first thing I wanted to do was come up. I said, I, I, I know I want to do a, a, a superhero shared world. Um I had done, and I continue to do superhero stories on my own. And I said, you know, it, it would be perfect for for um, for a, a crazy eight anthology. Um, and then I said, well, so what can we do that's different from what others have done? Um, and one thing I knew I wanted to do was have people have have characters who come from different places, um, just like at Marvel, just like at DC. Uh, rather than a particular incident uh, creating a generation of superheroes, I wanted them to come from different places, and uh, and but they had to uh, they had to exist in a in a time and place where they were needed, and you know when superhero when are superheroes needed? Uh, very often times of war, uh, times of uh, economic hardship. These are the things that, that often give rise to a generation of superheroes. So I thought, let's, let's go with the economic hardship angle. And uh, one thing I very much wanted to do was have, um, was have our characters interact. Because that, that creates a feeling of reality. You know, when, when you have a hero kind of working in a vacuum, that's great, but it gives it so much more, that, uh, it makes it so much more interesting and, and real seeming to, to have characters interacting with one another. And that was one of the fun parts of, of Marvel, for instance, when they first got started, is you might, you might have a Spider-Man comic with Daredevil guest starring. And, uh, uh, and, or he might just be in the background somewhere swinging by. Or you might see the Fantastic Four on a news report in a Spider-Man comic. So that kind of integration, I thought was, was something we should emulate and we have. In fact, Bob, Bob, uh, Bob's story in the first volume uh, uh, was very much a, a, an integration with other writers. What happened there was once the 
each author came up with their characters and we shared the roster with, with the group to see um, Aaron Rosenberg, Glenn Hellman, and I all realized our people were all cybernetically connected one way or another. So we said the three of us should, you know, come up with something. And, and we got on a phone call and we started beating out a story where basically Aaron's character, Black Hat, and my government agents, the cyber um, engagement division, went to the same locale and they were more or less directed there by this mysterious null that was Glenn's uh, contribution. And our two characters are there at the same place for different reasons and have an interaction and then go off, then go off and do their own thing, wondering more, you know, like, who are those people? You know, what is a black hat? Uh, and we'll see where that goes in the second volume. Yeah. So we have, a we're interacting. We're interacting, and I think it's I think it's not only fun for the reader, but fun for the writer as well. Um, so, is there a limit on an upper side of like, oh, we're not going to add any more new superheroes, or is there going to constantly be like an ebb and flow? In some so superhero universes, the superheroes are almost unkillable, and then in others, they kill them a dime a dozen. So, how are you approaching that for realism? we're not restricting anyone from from killing another character but we, but there are processes to do that you know if you want to if i want to kill one of bob's characters i have to go to bob and get him to agree that that i can do that i can't just do it um i mean and I my characters are cybernetically enhanced human beings so easily the, my guys could fall on the the course of battle and the government will just hire more and Bob, Bob could, of course, kill any of his own characters. Um, but other things can happen to them and, and will. Um, there's, uh, there's no one who's untouchable in, in that regard. But again, you need, you need uh, that dynamic behind the scenes where the guy who's writing about it and the guy whose character it is have to, have to agree that that's going to happen. You can't just, I can't just kill Bob's character. Um, because that wouldn't be that wouldn't be right, you know. And I know to, where I know where you live. And yes, that's right. <laughs> you might kill one of my characters, and that would be bad. But uh, but 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 it could happen. It could happen, and I I would venture to say it will. Okay, so you talked about how you came up with the universe, but you didn't mention the bad guys. So how how are the bad guys working? Is that also a collaborative process, or was that already there from the beginning that these were going to be the bad guys? Well, I think the general description of the bad guys as 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 rich guys who want to stay rich and are willing to to oppress the common man in order to do so. I think that general description uh, was something I provided, but. Um, each writer ran with that in a different way. Um, and so they're writing about these, what are essentially these American oligarchs. Um, they might be writing about the, the oligarch himself. They might be writing about uh, one of his henchmen or henchwomen. And um, uh, everybody's different. I didn't want to, I didn't want to restrict anybody too much. I wanted to give them as, as much free reign as possible excuse me, as possible, because uh, I felt like that's, that's how we would get the best anthology. So every, you know, everybody's got their own, their own bad guy. Okay. So how did you, so that's how you came up with the universe. So specifically uh, season of darkness, which is the current anthology that's that we're here to discuss, which is on Kickstarter right now. Um, and we'll link that in the show notes. Um, so how did you come up with the idea for this specific anthology collection? Well, um, we wanted, we, we established the basic universe in the first volume. In the second volume, we wanted to ratchet it up a little bit. And, um, and it's organic. It didn't, you know, there's not a master plan. Uh, what I did is I looked at the... Um, at what we had written in the first volume. And I said, hey, here's a promising uh, uh, platform for the second volume. 
and it was basically it basically came from um, the stories of Russ Colchimiro and Hildy Silverman, who um, who were kind of heading in a direction I thought was intriguing, and uh, and that's a sort of um, mega bad guy behind all the other bad guys, even though they might not even know it. Sort of a capo de tutti capo. And, and he's, uh, he or she is, uh, is um, pulling the strings of even the, of even the oligarchs. So we get into that a little bit. And, um, and some of the things that this mega bad guy does um, uh, force our heroes to work together in different ways. Can't tell you exactly what's going on, but that's basically. So how close to modern politics do you go? Because obviously, you know, you could potentially lose half the audience if you get too close to that crazy third rail. So is your you, your politics in this world universe contained? Um, we, we don't get into politics too much. To tell you the truth, the earliest version, Bob will tell you, the earliest version of this was political, um, but we steered away from it. And now we're just going after uh, uh, these... Um, these uh, these rich bad guys, um, but you but you can't touch on these rich American oligarchs uh, wreaking havoc and putting down the man without some aspect of politics being being a part of this. How Congress and the Oval Office might be uh, enabling or turning a blind eye to, and whether or not our characters and uh, the citizens. Are going to put up with this because you know every four years there's going to be an election um you know so that that's ripe for exploration but not yet yeah you know um i i didn't again i didn't i didn't really hand down restrictive orders in there in, in that regard or in any regard you know i mean for instance a lot of our it turns out a lot of our um uh uh characters are on the uh, LBGTQ spectrum somewhere. And that wasn't, I didn't tell people, I didn't tell our writers, that's what you got to do. And I didn't also, I also didn't tell them, steer, steer clear of that. They just did that on, on their own. So um, uh, I guess if, if one of the writers uh, wanted to write a story that was pretty political, that would be okay. It's, um, we're not, we're, we're, you know, the crazy eight ethos is to, to write what, what, what you're passionate about. And if you're passionate about something political, I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn it down out of hand. Okay. So before we dig in deeper uh, into this, we're going to take a moment where we share that glorious cover art that does not yet have the title on it because... Uh, you guys haven't titled this, um, done that part of the art yet, but so what can you tell us about this art that we're looking at? Okay, well, um, on uh, it, let's start. We'll start on the right. On the right is Syntax S Y N T A X, and she uh, she can manipulate people's uh, minds through their language center. Um, so that's that's her her deal. Um, down next to her in the, with the red top, that's Lipstick Lily. She's got that bandolier of, of specialty lipsticks. And she actually operates in Cleveland because so does the writer. Um, next to her in the, in the whitish outfit, right, um, is Luminosity. And uh, that's uh, Keith R.A. DeCandido's character. She, she manipulates light. And she's the, the hero of the Bronx. Uh, and uh, and so she 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 works to, to help the common people in the Bronx. Um, next to her in the trench coat um, is Penny Trouble, which if you say it the right word sounds like penetrable, uh, because that's what she does. She penetrates solid objects. Um, Penny Trouble, and that's that's Hildy Silverman's character. And then the character in the middle is Better Angel, which. I can't believe nobody has come up with the title Better Angel before because I think it's amazing. 
you know, it was uh, <coughs> a quote from Abraham Lincoln about uh, about solving the uh, the um, issues that divided the country during his um, his term in office, and he refers to our better angels, um, our our um, our our virtues, and so better angel is a, is a virtuous character. Uh, who we'll learn more about in this in this second volume, um, and uh, and the you'll notice it's all women on the cover. You know, I just felt like, hey, why not? Let's have all women on the cover of the second one. Um, on uh, on other covers, you won't see that, but but I figured we should do that at least once. It felt it felt right. And what you see in in the background is New York City, uh, more or less. Um, uh, because most of these stories take place in New York City. It's like the early Marvel characters. We're all pretty much gathered in New York City. Um, uh, it's, it, it lends itself. It's also where there are greatest differences in, in, um, in uh, economic condition, right? You have, you have economically uh, challenged neighborhoods, and you also have Wall Street. So, you know, you, you've got the extremes there. So what made you decide to use New York as opposed to creating your own sort of clone of it, like Gotham City is or, or some of the others? Right. You know, there was that choice. And I, I felt like it would be more grounded, I guess, as Stan Lee did, uh, if we used at the actual New York instead of Gotham City or Metropolis. Um, I wanted it to be the, as close as possible to, to our reality. Because superheroes are so far-fetched, um, the, the more we could anchor it in reality, I felt we should. Okay. So let's move on to the uh, Season of Darkness, the, the anthology collection that, that's on the Kickstarter. So what would your 30-second elevator pitch be? And either one of you can answer these going forward. The thirty-second. Well, I would say I would say um, uh, a a new, more powerful villain arises, and uh, and creates new uh, new and uh, much more difficult problems for for our heroes. Um, you know, the one ironically, the heroes that that are the most powerful will be the ones most in need of help. Uh, when this when this um, this villain has her 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 way. Okay, and I will say as we look at this cover art for people looking to do uh, cosplay, I will say that as far as cosplay goes, these would be some pretty easy ones for a novice person to get into. So uh, so maybe check that out. But I mean, one of the thinking, right. Jr. One of the things we were, were considering when doing this, being in prose. We were definitely coming up with characters and outfits that made sense in the real world that Mike presented us with. Um, so um, Better Angel is as close to a traditional superhero costume as I think uh, the collection has. Everybody else is in pretty much street gear, one type or another. So yes, very cosplayable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you would, and and yet distinctive enough that if you, particularly the three. In the middle on this cover, um, if you were to cosplay them, they're distinctive, right? They're not like any any other uh, character. Um, although the colors, I'll, I'll tell you, the colors for Better Angel were uh, inspired by a Cosmic Boy costume. Cosmic okay. Boy from the superheroes, but the colors alone. Um, but yeah, they they're distinctive enough that you could cosplay them, and and uh, in fact. In fact, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So what is it you think that makes this universe that, that Crazy 8 Press created special? I, I think some of it is is that real world aspect of it. Um, you know, you know, the first successful superhero prose anthology is of course George R. R. Martin's Wild Cards, but with each successive volume. It is less and less a recognizable world to what we have today, whereas this is 
as Marvel likes to say, the world outside your window. It's very recognizable and very relatable. And I think uh, readers would appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think so too. We're trying to, we're trying to ground it in, in actual, in, in actual situations, actual places, and actual human reactions. You know, um, one of the most interesting stories in the first volume is by Dan Hernandez, who, who um, co-wrote the Adams Family Two movie and uh, also the Pokemon Detective movie. Um, and Dan, Dan's characters. Are two sisters, one of one of whom can grow like sort of like Giant Man, and the other one who shrinks like Ant Man or the Atom. And and what's interesting about them is is their relationship. One of them one of them is uh, is sort of a shrinking violet, and the other one is very much out there and very uh, very um, uh, uh, big. She has a big personality and a big reputation. And, and so it's not just their powers and what they can do or the way they look. It's also how their powers relate to their personalities and how their personalities relate to each other. Um, and, I, and I will say, you know, Dan's a great writer, but we've got a bunch of great writers in, in, in this anthology. And if someone's interested in superhero uh prose stories this is the place for them uh you'll see you'll see things that you haven't seen before um you'll see people writing superhero stories that you haven't seen write superhero stories before and uh, and and it's it's you know like i say the power and the and the momentum of these of these anthologies comes from the talents of the writers Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your the superhero you contributed. So, so Bob, what did you add to the collection? Who are you writing? I've got the government agents, the you know the, the equivalent of Shield. Uh, there's an a old, largely forgotten one season wonder on NBC from the 1970s called Search, which at the time cybernetically implanted devices in their field agents, and it was a privately run agency. Um, search and recovery for lost goods or people and such. Um, I always loved the show. I loved the concept and I loved exploring at what point do you become so cybernetic? You, you lose your humanity. So our government agents are on that path and I've got a whole, you know, I got a field squad and they got the people back at the agency. And so, you know, in a large sense, the CED agents can certainly be, some of the glue that that connects um, the larger world, depending upon uh, the need for government agents to get involved. Yeah, and I think one okay. of the reasons one of the reasons that 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 Bob's story is so intriguing, there are two reasons. One one is that uh, he he he's working with other writers to to create a reality and a and and a, and a, a, a sort of a complex uh, fabric. Um, and the other is that it's just something he's passionate about. He's really interested in this. If he wasn't writing this story, he'd be reading this story. Yeah. So, so it, it, it's always going to come out better when, you, when you're working under those conditions. And I will say one of my agents is a rookie, and we're sort of seeing um, this world through um, their eyes. Um, it's based on a student I taught last year who goes by they, the, them, and... Uh, named the character after them, and I had to read the story. I had them read the story to make sure I got all my pronouns right, and that was kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. Like so, you said, everybody, everybody's character is is a product of their individual imagination. Okay. So what about you, Mike? What did you contribute, or were you just the editor at large? No, I contributed. Uh, um, the I wrote the um, the character that started it all. His name is Bray Guardsman. Um, he's a roughly roughly speaking a Captain America type. Um, he doesn't go back to World War II. He's not a man out of time, but he's a he's a um, 
uh, like the original Captain America, non super non superpowered uh, uh, character, and he's just fighting the good fight, and and he had no idea that he'd be inspiring a generation of of heroes, uh, and he does, and some uh, he he actually prior to the opening of the book, he disappears and is presumed dead. And as the book opens, you find out, well, that might not be so. So there's a little mystery surrounding him. And in fact, I should tell you, there's a, lot of, there's a little mystery surrounding a lot of our characters. There are things we, we don't know about them yet. Um, uh, Jeff Thorne, who, who's done a lot of work uh, in, in television um, and is currently writing one of the Green Lantern titles, um, Jeff, a uh, great guy, great writer, and, and his character is named Rascal. And there's a lot of mystery surrounding Rascal. There, even Rascal doesn't know the answers to some of the questions. So um, if you were to read this only for the Rascal story, I think you'd be very intrigued. Um, and, uh, and, and you'd be on, on tenterhooks trying to, trying to second guess where this guy is going. Um, so, uh, so I, I came up with Grey Guardsman, but there were also some other characters because I thought we would need some more to perhaps, if, you know, maybe to kill, maybe to sacrifice in some other way, maybe to maim. You know, got to have a little maiming here and there, right? <laughs> what's, what's, a, what's, a, what's a book without a little maiming? So, uh, so we had some extra characters and they comprise a, a sort of like a mini Justice League called the United Front. Um, because early on when these, when these superheroes uh, uh, manifested, they, there were conflicts and, uh, and that wasn't productive. So Grey Guardsmen came up with this United Front to serve as a model for cooperation among these among these characters and one of the characters in united front the one that you see with the white whitish outfit with the uh, prism on her chest luminosity is one of the original members of united front gray guardsman's another and then there there are three or four others who um uh who i will write or offer for for uh, as guest stars to the other writers, um, and they'll be part of it as well. Right now, I would say we have about fifteen to twenty characters. I don't, I don't think we'll go too much beyond that. Um, uh, that's that seems to me to be about right for a superhero universe. Okay. Um, so this wouldn't be superheroes if there weren't sidekicks. So do you have any sidekicks in these stories that are, that are kind of cool? And obviously it doesn't have to be yours, just in the, in the collection. Huh. I don't think we have sidekicks. We have, uh, not in the traditional sense that I can think of. Yeah. You know, the, so oh, no, the whole no side Robin to the Batman, the whole sidekick thing when you dig down deep is a little unlikely, isn't it? You know, I mean, how likely it is, is it that a guy like Batman, uh, a, a kind of a grim and gritty character is going to take on a teenager to help him, you know, it, it works in the comics, you know, the writers in the comics do a great job, but when you do it in prose, in prose, you're always drilling down deeper. You kind of can't help it. Um, and, and, you know, when you get down to it, a sidekick is, it's just very unlikely. So, so I'm trying to think, do we have, you know, in a, in a way we have sidekicks, we kind of have helpers, non superpowered helpers in the lives of some of our characters. Um, but I, you know, it's a good question, uh, JR, but I don't, can't think of a sidekick. No. Maybe maybe for volume three. Yeah, right. Something to explore in later volumes. Okay. Rise. So were, there any, <laughs> were there any secondary characters that were a special memorable, especially memorable on what you wrote? Hmm. Secondary characters. Well, Greg Guardsman has a um, has a uh, associate 
who used to be one of his villains, as we'll as we'll find oh. out. Yeah. So he was one of his fiercest uh, antagonists and is now the guy who kind of looks after him. Uh, uh, he's a rich guy and he, you know, and he can. So, so he does that. He's one of the, one of the, um, American oligarchs who we call the captains of industry who, um, who kind of will, will say he went to the, to the light side. Um, let's see. Um, um, the, the woman in charge of the daytime operations for the CED, um, she, she's very particular and if you if she likes you you can have one of the cookies in the jar on her desk so you have to be cookie worthy which is something the agents are aspiring to so yeah. that's someone I want to have some fun with in this stories yeah 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 I, I like that and and uh, I think there are a couple of there are a couple of characters in the bureaucracy uh, at CED that that you can you can have fun with uh, in the stories. Um, mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay. There's uh, um, who, who else? Um, uh, uh, Lipstick Lily, been seen here in the red and black. Lipstick Lily has a sidekick. You know, she works for a cosmetics company. That's her job, and she has a sidekick who's, who's very funny, uh, and. Um, uh, and who uh, uh, you get, she gets a lot of humor uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of mileage out of him that way, and uh, and I think he'll be a character that we that we see. I guess in a way, in in a very very broad sense, he would be her her sidekick. You just wouldn't see him fighting crime alongside her. Um, let's see who else. Um, we one of the characters that that I should mention. A couple others that. That are really intriguing. They're not sidekicks and they're not secondary characters, but um, sarcastic fringehead is a is a character. She's an Asian American teenager who controls the salt. Her power is she can control salt, and uh, and Mary Fan, who writes her, does so in in very interesting ways. Um, and she has in in her life she has a a, a Chinese American grandmother. And I think she's a character that that we may see more of. Uh, she was an interesting character. Um, Michael Burstein, who's a perennial Nebula and Hugo uh, nominee, um, uh, has a character called Red Sky, who's uh, who's part Jewish, part African American, and uh, and an all hero. And uh, and he's his character uh, can do something called Chrono Back. He can go back in time 15 seconds, but he's got to kind of regenerate. He can't just do it one time after the other. Um, I'm trying to think. He has he has um, uh, a librarian who's sort of become a secondary character in his stories. He may turn up again uh, at some point. Um, and Lipstick Lily has a a villain sort of a sort of a low level hired villain in her stories who she ends up um can't what can i say without saying it <laughs> she she ends up this this villain may appear again in, in her stories we'll say that she's uh she's not quite as villainous as she might seem and and she and she might appear again in, in, in her stories so there are, you know, we have our J. Jonah Jamesons, we have our Betty Brandt, we have our um, uh, uh, Flash Thompsons. You know, in, in all these stories, there are supporting characters that, that make it more interesting. <clears throat> okay. So now, since you, I'm assuming, um, Bobby, you've also read a lot of the stories involved as well. So we're, we're going to speak more universe specific right now, but which tropes do you feel like that the Phenoms universe hits the best? Ooh, that's a really good question. And it's been a while since I looked at the original uh, volume stories because uh, we finished that back in late 2021 and time has passed. Tropes, Mike, help me out here. Tropes. Um, 
Well, you know, we have a super speedster. So that's a trope that we're that we're playing with. Um, Better Angel, who's who's seen flying here, she's sort of like a Supergirl character. She doesn't come from Krypton, but she's kind of virtuous, and and that's you know the, the powerful the powerful flying blonde is sort of a trope. Um, and, and I guess you know a uh, black hat because this is a a woman who discovers this amazing AI that's assisting her. Uh, so it's a voyage of discovery. It's sort of like getting the power ring for the first time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let me think. We have uh, one of one of our more interesting stories is um, about a a group of um, super intelligent animals, written by Ilsa J. Bick, and uh, who's a wonderful writer. And um, uh, these are these are these are a dog, a monkey. And a wolf who can talk to each other, uh, who can communicate telepathically because they've been engineered to do that. Um, and you know, so you have the the kind of intelligent animal. You know, in a way, it's it's sort of like a, the next generation of of Lassie, right? <laughs> these these super intelligent animals who can who can go out and and interact with human beings, and and you know. And save them not just from the well, but from the you know from these uh, oligarchs. Um, so you, you have you have some heroes who look like like great guardsmen um, who who look like oh I know what that one's about. I sure I I, I know what's going to happen, and you don't because they're not going in the direction that you expect. I mean, most of us have read comic books or have toiled in the comic book field. So we know what the tropes are. We know that people are going to expect things to happen a certain way. And the challenge for us is to creatively come up with a way that turns that on its ear. Right. Okay. So other than just the generic superhero genre, are there any other genres or subgenres that you feel like this collection fits into? Well, science fiction, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't have any supernatural characters. That's not, that's not the direction we're going in. So there's no, there's no Dr. Strange. There's no, um, or in the, in the mythological sense, um, there's also no alien at this point. Um, although that, that may happen at some point, but right now it's the, these are all people from earth and, um, they all have uh, acquired their abilities scientifically. Um, now, we don't always go into the details of what the science was, but uh, we all, but, but the, the assumption is that they're all working on the basis of, of, of something that's been scientifically uh, given to them. Um, and, and one could say it's a bit of a dystopia without being as dystopic as 1984, but it's obviously the world down on its heels, which is what's giving rise to these characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's science fictional in that sense. Also, um, it's, it's not a fantasy. It's not a fantasy. We, you know, I know, I know you have to, you have to, you have to kind of, you have to kind of head in that direction. You have to kind of go to the border of fantasy when you see somebody running, you know, 100 miles an hour or flying. But, um, uh, but, but the idea is that everything has a, has a scientific underpinning, whether we actually go into detail on it or not. Okay. So, you know, obviously as creators of content, as authors, we do horrible things to our characters. So if yours <laughs> met you in a back alley and they knew who you were and the things you had done to them, how do you see that interaction playing out, Mike? <laughs> oh boy. How would they, how would they, well, the, I haven't, the only one I've, I've tortured at all is, um, is Bray Guardsman. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's given up his life to, to be this, to be this hero. Um, not literally apparently, but, but he's, uh, he's given up a normal life to be this hero. 
and uh, and he's this kind of world weary character, and uh, he he does this because he has to do this because someone has to do it. But I think he'd be just as happy not doing it, and uh, and so he probably probably wouldn't be grateful to me for creating a world where he had to do it. And I guess, you know, because uh, my story is focusing on two characters, the, the veteran taking the uh, rookie out on the first field mission, um, it turned out okay. Uh, they may actually not hurt me, but thank me because um, this rookie thinks Black Hat's kind of hot. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, whose character would really hate them? Um, hmm. I mean, they're all under duress. They're all, they're all stressed, but maybe, maybe, maybe Torque. Maybe. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's, he's a tortured guy. He would probably hate Paul Copperberg. <laughs> he probably would. Come to think of it. Although Paul understands him, so maybe maybe you cut him a break. Yeah, Torque Torque would get torqued off at Copperberg. Uh -huh. um, so uh, this is uh, the second anthology. It looks like, um, and you mentioned that the universe can continue to grow. Will there be novelization in this, or will it stay in anthology form? That's a good question. I thought about that. Um, uh, it may just stay in anthology. Um, depending on how it develops and what kind of ideas come of this, it's possible that some novels may arise from this. Um, but uh, whatever we do, we're kickstarting. And so as long as we're doing that, um, I think I think uh, a novels, if they happen, there won't be many of them. I think for the most part, it'll still be an anthology. As with any shared universe, um, the readers are going to tell us which characters they love the most and uh, will want to see in future anthologies. And, and it, you know, if there's a real breakout, uh, you know, a novel might be warranted. Um, but, you know, first got to get the second one funded and, uh, you know, see how that's re uh, people react to that and then uh, plan for the future. Yeah. So yeah. this will be airing on Monday, the let's see, 4th, 5th, 6th. Uh, mm -hmm. So it will be have a few days left. So if this sounds like something that's up your alley, hop on over to that Kickstarter and the link will be in the show notes and go ahead and throw a few bucks their way because that's how you get the content you like. How many anthologies do you think you'll do? Is there a set arc already or are you just going to see what the readers, what the audience will bear? We're going to see what the audience will bear. I, 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 I've, I've said that, that the goal is to keep on producing these anthologies you know, till cockroaches rule the earth. Um, but but that's a great plan. It's a great aspiration. But we still have to fund this one. And uh, we're about, I think we're about 55% in, but we only have like eight days left. So, you know, if this one doesn't happen, then everything's in jeopardy. We really, really have a real world uh, 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 challenge here. And, um, you know, you know, when somebody funds this, when somebody backs it at any level, um, they're not just they're not just backing an idea they like. Um, they're supporting the the relationship between the reader and the writer. You know, I think I think people who read things like science fiction and fantasy have a talent um, that's often overlooked. A writer can give you details but they can't paint the whole picture for you. You have to have the kind of um, uh, sensibility that, that makes you receptive to these details and enables you to take them and fill in the blanks and create a world and create characters and, and, and see how it, how it could operate. And, and that relationship is very important. I think that's, that's at the core of, of science fiction and fantasy. And projects like this are the ones that people have to support because that's what keeps that relationship alive despite whatever else might be happening in the world of publishing 
Okay. Well, I know you guys got to go soon, so we're gonna we're gonna jump to the fun ones as we start wrapping this up. But of all the superpowers that exist in this universe, which one would you guys want for your daily life? And we'll go with you first, Bob. You know, I've got a fear of heights, but I would love to fly, and maybe that would help me conquer okay, it. About- I mean, you know. <laughs> what about you, Mike? You know, you know, I was gonna say flying, but now I can't say it because Bob. Is. <laughs> but but I. I I'll say this, I think a lot of the things I do in life, a lot of the recreation I take part in is because I really want to fly. I mean, I, I, I kayak a lot. Um, and, and, and when I'm kayaking, I kind of feel like I'm flying, you know, so, so I do, that would be the power, but let's say I can't do that because Bob's doing it. So let's see, I think, um, let's pick, super strength wouldn't it be nice okay. to, be to do to do anything anything you want with with just the power of your of your hands or your body i mean that's super strength I, that goes back to to our earliest aspirations right super strength yeah i'm sure hercules and samson and the like all right. So now that we've talked about what superpower you would pick, how would you corrupt it in your daily life? So what would you do with that super strength if you had it? How would I corrupt it? Right, right. So, you know, you, you talk about the general attack, the magic you'd want, and then how you would use and abuse it in your daily life. Oh. So, like, I don't know, if you could read mine, suddenly maybe you don't pay for a Coke again at the grocery store or something to that effect. I think – um I mean, how would I use it? How would I use it? I'd take some of these dead trees in my backyard. I'd take them down without, you know, and, and, and not have to listen to my wife asking me to get rid of them. <laughs> I would, that's what I would do, you know, to begin with. I mean, you know, you, there, there are things you could do with your strength that, along those lines. I, I would try really hard not to be corrupted by it because I've read too many too many uh, uh, cautionary tales um, in comics and books about about people getting corrupted by power. Um, I guess I guess the the danger, if you have super strength, the danger is that you could hurt somebody with it. And and you know, we, they're all. Let's face it. Let's be honest. We all have people that we want to hurt, and uh, and you got to be careful not to not to let that that power damage them. Okay. And what about you, uh, Bob? How would you abuse that flying? I'm in a community that has five different entrances and at each entrance, it says no soliciting. And yet we still have people bringing us uh, takeout menus or uh, cleaning service cards. Uh, I would probably buzz them and terrify them and scare them uh, to never coming back to the neighborhood. Works for me. I approve. All right. So uh, clearly this interview is winding down. But before we wrap this up, was there anything about Phenom, uh, Phenomenon Season of Darkness Anthology that we didn't ask you that you want to tell us? I know you guys are on a tight deadline. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think I think the best thing that somebody can do is um, is is read some of the – you know, we've been posting um, – excerpts from the stories with the help of one of our writers um on from the, facebook it's from and the I, first book right from the first book and and i think you know i think it'd be a great idea to to, to find those and um uh, i've been sharing them bob's been sharing them and uh find them and 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 sample them and get a sense of the kind of writing it's i, I you know we can say Oh, it, the writers are great, and, and the writing is great, and take our word for it. But I think, I think um, if you sample it, you'll get a sense of of how much better this is than than uh, than other things that you may have read. Okay, and this is a the question that some of our listeners are families that listen together, and I know because they write us to tell us that. So one of the questions they've asked us to start including is sort of the age range for the audience because. Sometimes the content might be written for a certain age, but not for their maturity level. And that's sort of a thing when you've got precocious readers. So how would you rate the age range where these stories are appropriate? Um, um, you know, I don't think that it's grisly and it's violence and it's certainly not uh, graphically sexual. So I would, Mike, 
has also been a teacher, so he can help me with this. But I'm thinking 12 and up. I was just going to say that okay. 12 and up would be ideal, which is not to say, because Bob and I were both reading this stuff when we were younger than that. It's not to say that someone younger couldn't, but I think uh, probably younger than 12, maybe, um, maybe a parent would want to monitor it. Um, but it's not, you know, there's no overt sex. There's no, not a whole lot of cursing. It's, it's kind of toned down um, because we're, we're aware of, of this. We don't want to preclude any, anybody of any age from reading it. Okay. So will this be out in um, an audio book or is it just going to be print and, and digital? Uh, right now, we're looking at print and digital. It could always become an audio book, and if it and it would be cool if it did, because we would have all the individual writers reading their stories. So it's possible. But right now, we just have. Oh, that's a nice twist for an anthology. Yeah. Um, all right. So. Yeah. Right now, if they're if they're just, like we normally like to encourage readers to review the product. Uh, right now, since it looks like you're only available with fulfilling orders through Kickstarter. Is there anywhere people can review your products once they buy it? Well, the first Phenomenon's book is now available through Amazon. So you can get it as a Kindle ebook or you can get it as a uh, paperback from Amazon. Uh, so they can review it there or at Goodreads. I think it's got a couple of uh, reviews already. Okay. Yeah. So if, if, uh, if they wait till it goes to Amazon, they can do it there. All right. So this is the part, dear listener, where I tell you that I know go. Chat, chat, go. Got interrupted. I guess Disney Disney lost his attention. All right. So uh, this is the part where we tell you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part, people. As we bring this We're to a close, Bob, uh, can you tell here. listeners? Can you tell listeners how they can find you? Uh, www.bobgreenberger.com or at Bob Greenberger Twitter and Instagram. Uh, all right, and all of that will be in the show notes. And what about you, Mike? Uh, I'm on uh, I'm on uh, Facebook, uh, Michael Jan Friedman. I'm at uh, Friedman MJ on Twitter, uh, crazy8press.com or michaeljanfriedman.net. All right. And you can find us at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show, twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can join us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month and help us keep the lights on. And finally, you can support the show at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section this for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co-hosts Doc Saska and Nick Garber duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. So we want to thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Saska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things.